It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. People are usually more comfortable talking about their strengths rather than their weaknesses. It's human nature. The same can be said about religious studies. When scholars talk about it, you can expect them to emphasize the positive, to talk about what they love about it. But like many academic fields, religious studies faces some challenges. Some of these challenges come from the outside, like when schools and governments and religious traditions want to know why religious studies ought to be pursued at all. But other challenges come from within, when different scholars disagree with each other about what the field should even be. In this episode, a former president of the American Academy of Religion joins us to talk about the challenges of religious studies. His name's Thomas Tweed. He's currently a professor at the University of Notre Dame. Some of you might recognize his name from the Maxwell Institute's Mormon Studies Review, where he's previously published. Thomas Tweed spent a lot of time thinking about external and internal challenges to religious studies. His proposed solution to these challenges might sound surprising. He says religious studies scholars should think and talk more to each other about values. He explains in this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Please send your questions and comments to mipodcast at byu.edu. And thanks for listening. We're joined today by Thomas Tweed. He was the president of the American Academy of Religion in 2015, and he's currently the Welch Professor of American Studies and a professor of history at Notre Dame. And we're talking about his 2015 AAR presidential address, where he talked about the value of religious studies in the academy and discussions about the proper way to do religious studies in the academy. Tom, thanks for taking the time to visit the Maxwell Institute podcast. Sure. Glad to be here. I wanted to begin by talking about some of the challenges that are facing the academic study of religion right now. I, I have a master's degree in religious studies from Georgetown, and it's been uh, three years since I was in school. And so I encountered some of these as I did my studies. Let's talk a little bit about some of the difficulties people face when they enter the academic study of religion. Sure. I, I think there's probably a long list for me and for others, not to focus only on the bad things, because there's some good news, too. But um, I think the, st the study of religion is devalued or ignored in public life. Uh, there are declining undergraduate majors in some places, though it's actually growing in other places, interestingly. Um, PhD graduates don't really find meaningful work or humane working conditions. So sometimes people are stringing together, teaching one course at multiple, multiple institutions. Um, doctoral granting institutions sometimes that who are wonderful in other ways don't actually always list their placement rates or adjust their training to fit the job market. Departments are being cut or pressured to defend themselves in terms of higher education funding and really narrow notions of what useful means. I think there are debates among folks in the study of religion and there's kind of public contests of all sorts. Um, I'm worried about all those things and uh, a few more. When you talk about placement rates, this is something that people who aren't in the academy might not be familiar with. This is the idea that when an institution grants degrees to a number of students, how many of those people go on to get jobs in that field? Is that right? Right. And, and it's an issue across the humanities. So if you look at statistics since 2008, and I'm not the numbers guy on all this, although I've seen some of these numbers, but it's true in history and English and religion and American studies and in lots of fields that um, the number of jobs have gone down. And so the proportion of people getting uh, meaningful employment from PhDs in graduate programs in humanities fields uh, has gone down a little bit. And you said there's a declining number of, of people who are majoring in it in some places, but increasing in other places. Do you have any more specifics about that and what might be causing that? I'm not really entirely sure. I think sometimes in, in a couple of places in the South, in Alabama, Oklahoma, Texas, there are some programs that have actually uh, either maintained or grown. And you could argue that that's just because that's part of a Bible belt. And of course, they're interested in religion. But I think it's also in some places there's been ingenuity, good good ways of reaching out to constituency um, you have to. You don't have to make the case for the study of religion in quite the same way 
in some parts of the country that you do in others. So, for example, in the Pacific Northwest, in Washington, Oregon, places where surveys data all shows us that fewer people are uh, churchgoers uh, and so on, it's a little bit harder to make that case, though there's certainly some presence of a study of religion in the Pacific Northwest, too. So these are some of the challenges that kind of come from the university or, or from different state legislatures or from, you know, kind of outside the actual field itself. So there are also some challenges from within that you talked about in your presidential address. What are some challenges facing the academic study of religion that happens inside the academic study of religion? Yeah, I think there's both. Um, besides the outside challenges, which in public universities includes legislatures that want to do away with the study of religion, public uh, agencies that don't take it seriously, among those who already study that, and the AAR is one organization, the American Academy of Religion, which is along with the Society for Biblical Studies of Things, the SBL, bring about 10,000 people to an annual meeting every year, which is maybe hard to imagine for other people, but there's somewhere a little bit less than 9,000 members of the American Academy of Religion. So it's quite large. About 15% maybe are from other parts of the world or outside the United States. And, and there's all kinds of challenges uh, in the AR, and they actually reflect the challenges in America at large, I would say. There's kinds of uh, divisions and debates about lots of things. The same kinds of divisions in universities where you find differences between humanities and arts people and social science and natural science people. So should the study of religion be more like uh, biology or more like uh, literature? Should scholarship be just something you do for its own sake? Or should we actually try to make thing, make the world better? So a difference between what people would call activist scholarship and um, scholarship just because it's a good thing to know. There are divisions between people who would identify as scholars of religious studies who would see their work almost com entirely in conversation with colleagues in, um, in other disciplines across universities. So they want they want colleagues in history or philosophy or sociology to take seriously what they're doing and are less interested in the kind in the implications for their work for religious communities themselves and then there's others those who who, who would identify themselves as the, as theologians or working from and for uh, religious communities and that could be christian it could be jews it could be buddhists it could be muslims although they would all not accept the label theology, but people who are working from and for communities of faith. And that's, and that's one of the divisions uh, that's, that fragments conversations and really shuts down talk. Does that so, happen between the AAR and the SBL as well? Are there some of the discussions that go on between those two groups are rooted in some of these same divisions? To some extent, although... Some scholars of the Society of Biblical Literature would, would argue that they're more rigorous, more like scholars in uh, other disciplines, in, in classics, in history, in literature, than uh, some of the AAR are. But um, I think some, some, of the argue, some of the assumption, I think incorrect, uh, from AAR, some, some AAR members, is that the SBL uh, members, Biblical Literature people, are all on the theology side. Some clearly are. Some uh, biblical scholars work in seminaries and would say, would clearly align themselves with the faith tradition, but others are not that way. But, and so there is a little bit of that divide, but mostly it's also within the American Academy of Religion. So in terms of studying religion in general, the value of studying religion in general, um, some current scholars of religion feel a bit embattled. And, and so there's this sense that they need to justify the pursuit in general, especially when they're looking at things like the economy and, you know, United States education focus on STEM things, on math and technology and these types of issues. And people say studying religion in higher education to some would be seen as a waste of time. So what kind of reasons do people generally give? You talked about these in your presidential address. Uh, what kind of reasons do people generally give for to justify the study of religion? And then you offer some tweaks of those and some suggestions about how to tighten those up a little bit. Yeah, there, I think there's been three main kinds of arguments that folks have made when talking to state legislatures, when talking to boards of private universities, 
to donors. Whenever uh, the study of religion is, is embattled in some way, these are, there's three kinds of arguments that pre- people bring, and sometimes they combine them. First, that the study of religion advances knowledge. We know more stuff. Secondly, it enriches individuals. And third, it improves society. So those are the three main kinds, and they have lots of variations on how they work. Uh, part of my point is that we pr- there's ways that we probably need to refine those three uh, in a couple of ways to be a little bit more effective. And, and that would mean uh, talking about values, considering the local context, and recognizing that there's lots of different goods that people might value. As you've laid these additional sort of benefits out, it seems like one of the big concerns for the academic study of religion just comes down to funding, it sounds like. If, if it's convincing legislatures uh, and academic bodies and donors, is funding play a really big part in, in why, why scholars have to defend the study of religion? Yeah, I think I think scholars feel uh, that they have to defend it for, for at least a couple of reasons. Some of them are uh, to students. Religion departments and those who study religion in other departments have to explain why they should not, those students should not be in business or engineering or pre-med or something else, and why it's uh, worth doing in some way. And then the other side of it, they have to defend to deans and presidents and provosts and donors uh, why the source of revenue at the resources new faculty lines support for all sort of all sorts should actually go to the to uh, those studying religion so it's both those things i think and when they talk about increasing knowledge for its own sake is one of the justifications i mean i guess i guess you could say that about pretty much anything though so what what would distinguish the study of religion from anything else in terms of increasing knowledge you know, most of those kinds of arguments don't want to appeal to any kind of practical or pragmatic or useful um, language. So they just want to say it's good to know. Um, but I think the objection that somebody can raise uh, ab- about this approach is the one that you raise, which is, well, I want to know about astronomy, too. And I want to know how water faucets work. Why, why is anything more interesting than anything else? And I think that's a good argument. And that's why in some ways, that's the least effective of these three kinds of arguments. The only people who will find that useful are basically when you're preaching to the converted, if they already think it's interesting, because that's why most of those kinds of arguments have to shift to one of the other two to to give it a little bit more power, namely that it's good for individuals or good for society. So then you get into some of these more concrete reasons. When when you talk about it being good for society, for example, this seems to sort of step on that line, that argument between should scholars of religion be more activist minded or should they be more withdrawn and sort of just, you know, descriptive more than prescriptive or this sort of thing. So how does that shake out that kind of discussion about improving society as a justification? But some people just want to do just scholarship without thinking about how it impacts society. Yeah, and, and, and for those folks who are not really activists, who are not going to be on the front lines in any protests or doing volunteering in the community, that some of them would say you don't have to do that, of course, because the very act of doing this, engaging in the scholarly study of religion, when done well, will all, already prepare individuals to, to, to do the right kinds of things in society. So, for example, uh, violence is a part of our world. Uh, some of the arguments are is that empathic understanding of other worlds, understanding what it means to be Muslim and Buddhist and Jewish and Hindu and Christian uh, and atheist can help make people more tolerant, can lead to less violence and more inclined to step in and by whether it's intended or not, one kind of concomitant or Uh, unintended consequence, sometimes it's intended, is that it just um, prepares people to be better global citizens. And that's a second kind of version of that argument, which is just democracy needs it. Uh, Democratic citizenship requires that folks have a certain understanding of the range of people uh, in the civil society. And it prepares you to engage, whether it's at anything from the PTA to the electoral college uh, from your local city hall 
to national Senate elections, understanding about religious diversity at home and around the world makes you just a better citizen. What about when it comes to religious people themselves? So, for instance, some religious communities are uncomfortable with religious studies because of assumptions about religious studies as being like a fully secular pursuit that's somehow diminishing of religious faith or that is critical of religious faith. And so is that a fair picture uh, that some religious bodies have, that, that religious studies is just a secular enterprise that's sort of out to almost debunk or explain religion? Um, yeah, the folks who engage in the study of religion are like the rest of the American population and have a wide range of personal standpoints on this, from the deeply devout to the village atheist. So I think every, there's all sorts of people doing it. But as it's done well, meaning carefully, respectfully, responsibly, um, I would say uh, the goal is not really to make people more or less religious. And that, and when I taught at public institutions, I would often say that. My job is to make you more authentically you. I'm not trying to convert you one way or the other or change your mind about that. I want you to be more informed about it. And we're gonna take the tools in, the, in arts and sciences from anthropology and history and literature and philosophy, and we're gonna apply them to, to study religion. And in the process, you might end up being more devout or less devout or uh, or anything else. So I don't think it's in principle corrodes faith, though for those who've never thought seriously about their faith, any kind of systematic reflection, of course, can be occasionally disorienting. But but if you haven't thought much about your faith, then maybe you, maybe you should. That's Tom Tweed. We're talking to him today about studying religion in the academy, what it's like, what some of the debates about the study of religion are. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about talking about values as a way to approach disagreements about how to study religion. So the American Academy of Religion sort of considers itself to be sort of a big tent organization. Some characterize it as welcoming of all sorts of different approaches to how to study religion. And in your presidential address, you say that uh, some of us stand clustered with the like-minded off to one corner where we whisper and sometimes intemperately announce our objections to the way that other people are doing their work. So. In order to approach these different clusters of people, as a president of AAR, it seems like you wanted to get people talking to each other more openly about some of these disagreements. Is that is that accurate? I did. Yeah, to some extent, uh, what I wanted to do, what I really wanted to do was just talk about my, my research. But unfortunately, I decided that uh, a presidential address, you should act, and what you should do as president, which I was in 2015, you should actually ask, what does the organization need? I would have been happy to go talk about religion in the United States or something else, my research, my current research, but I thought what was needed was a little bit more conversation. To some extent, my goals were really quite minimal. Could we please talk to each other? Uh, and, and then that's really all I wanted to do. And some people would think that's a pretty low bar, and maybe it is, but uh, I'm not sure it was. And then, so the, the, the task I set for myself was to figure out okay, people have approached this in different ways. Is there some way that we might do it more effectively and we might respect everybody in the conversation and allow them to be distinctively themselves? And then what I really wanted to move us toward was thinking through, and it really extends to what I think we should do in American society. Uh, what do we share and what we don't, what, what, what values do we share and what values don't we share? So you, yeah, so you struck on talking about values as the way to kind of cut through these issues. Why are some people wary of values talk? Well, they think we've had more than enough values talk and they're worried about it because they, they, they worry because they think it's the imposition of other people's values, whether it's through legislatures or something else that is part of the problem. And I recognize that. And so the strategy to some extent was to say, if that's what you're worried about, if you think you don't have any, you don't make judgments about what people should do or think, then I think you're probably, uh, you're basically mistaken. So I wanted to sort of first convince people that value judgments were inevitable, that we all identify what's admirable or what we and other people should do or should think. And we make judgments as scholars do it all the time. And when, when we read each other's work, uh, when we think about things, we all make certain kinds of judgments. And so the first step was to say that it's inevitable. 
That's right. So this inevitability of value judgments, one of the things you say is that scholars of religion encode epistemic values. So we're getting into some of the jargony stuff. They encode epistemic values in three different ways. So in other words, they, they evaluate or they put into their scholarship types of value judgments uh, when it comes to truth, the good, and beauty. Those are kind of the three right. that you see. Yeah, I, I'm not saying, and this is where some folks who would identify themselves as either not religious or feeling constrained in public university that they would they can't really talk about religious values. I'm not saying everybody can or should talk about religious values. So I'm setting that aside, and 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 at that I'm hoping that part of the folks gathered under the tent relax a little bit. But then I'm trying to make the next step to say, but there's a certain kind of value talk. And that's really the focus. What I decided to do was just focus on how people talk and not any highfalutin things about any other judgments. How is reality really structured or something? Just forget that and listen to our ordinary speech as scholars among ourselves. And if we do that, I think we'll, we'll see that there are epistemic values just a fancy way of saying values about what constitutes truth. So people, when talking about, um, it could be an article in the newspaper or it could be scholarship about an H, a sacred text, will criticize or praise something because it doesn't all hang together. It's not coherent. Or um, That's a value, so, like something that's should a hang together. Yeah. And it, or it's not objective, somebody might say, and that's a value. You know, it's too simplistic. So that means you think scholarship should be complicated. You think complicated things are better than that. Or you might say, you might turn to language about moral values and say that criticism of that book was unfair. So you think equity or fairness is an important moral value. And you might say that that book, yeah, it has some good details, but gosh, it's a terrible read or it's boring or it's clunky the way it's put together, to some extent you're appealing to aesthetic or values about beauty. It's just not an elegant or beautiful book. Sure, it has some stuff that's true, maybe even has some stuff that's good, it's just not beautiful. And I think scholars, whether they'd like to know it or not, or like to say it or not, talk that way all the time. And that was the first step to say, don't you recognize yourself in some of this conversation? Yeah, so you see this kind of language come out, especially most obviously probably in book reviews and, and things like that. But I think even scholars, as they do their own work, have <clears throat> have this built in, like when you, when something's not working in your paper, uh, it's right. because of these values that you have. Like you know this, you want this to be different, you can recognize it yourself. So we see it in the way that scholars evaluate the work of other scholars, but we also see it in our in the work that we do that we produce. Uh, those values are informing the work that we're doing and helping us know if we're on the right track or not, or what what we need to improve in our own work and things like that. So it's beyond just thinking of it as religious values, but values more broadly. So you're saying, look, we've got to talk about values because we're already doing it. We need to, if we make it explicit, we can be more careful with it. And um, when it comes to value judgments in the study of religion in particular, the study of religion has a really interesting history where different values have been emphasized at different times or people try to live up to different expectations at different times. And I'm thinking about when comparative, the comparative study of religion emerged back in the 1870s. There was this idea that it was going to be this scientific, objective, comparative assessment without bias. We we're going to do compare this religion to this religion. Looking back, um, how accurate were those expectations in the early study of religion? Yeah, no, it's, it's it's interesting to think about values and the, and the history of the study of religion, um, and and what the, the way I've tried to approach this argument and try to persuade people, I begin outside the study of religion by saying, look, scientists and mathematicians talk about the elegance of a formula. Why do they like this proof in mathematics more? If you listen to how mathematicians talk, they say it's elegant. Well, that's beauty talk. That's not truth talk. Um, and, I, and, I, and then, so for some folks, that helps them understand what I'm going at. Then I turn to the study of religion. And in the, um, most people would date the origins of, kind of, the, of, the, of the academic cross-disciplinary study of religion from around the 1870s. It happened in, uh, in, in Britain, in the United States, in the Netherlands, and so forth. Uh, and in that, 
uh, part of what I try to challenge for those who think it was always framed as an impartial, value-free enterprise, and some version, some folks did talk that way. A lot of the key folks actually thought that there were two kinds of tasks. First, to describe things as faithfully as you can, and then to make more men of judgments about it. So even some of the people that um, that scholars who would be uncomfortable with making value judgments today would recognize as important scholars, they actually thought that, that making judgments was part of it uh, in the beginning. And so part of that history was some leading people always thought there were some values at, um, at work. And what you get in the history of thinking about the study of religion in colleges and universities and seminaries is kind of changes over time about how they think about those values. Yeah, and it's interesting when it comes to those sort of normative judgments that they would make. I think one of the things is when you go back and read some of those old studies, there's also a sense that they were being objective in those judgments as well, that they had this sort of almost an objective eternal truth with which they could measure what they were evaluating. So is, would it still be fair to say that even though there were these different sort of exercises going on um, at the time, there was also this sense that those value judgments, those prescriptive or normative judgments had some sort of eternal verity about them as well? Um, yeah, cl clearly people thought they were getting at the historical truth or um, the truth about the origins of this religious tradition or the meaning of that sacred text. Um, they didn't all talk objective talk. So one of the things that's changed over time is uh, what are the particular kinds of words you use to describe uh, good scholarship? And they didn't all, they didn't all say objective. Uh, Max Weber, the, the famous German sociologist who influenced the study of religion in the 20th century, would talk about value-free scholarship, although his own work was not really that. And in other places, he sort of acknowledged that what scholars wanted to study and how they wanted to study it really had a lot to do with that. But they certainly thought, scholars always sort of thought that they were getting it right in some way. Yeah, or else they wouldn't be doing it, I guess. Oh, they wouldn't be doing it. Why would they, why would they do it? But uh, yeah. how they talked about what getting it right meant has varied over time. Yeah. When it comes to this idea of bracketing, for example, so you talked about uh, Weber's sort of trying to be value neutral and, and and this idea of bracketing starts getting discussed in academic scholarship of religion and it's still discussed today yeah so so for those who want to say i want to study religion but i want to find some some kind of space to engage uh, other disciplines across the university and some space that doesn't assume the religious truth of any particular tradition there's a couple of ways you can go. One of them is to say, like the sociologist Weber, that I'm interested in uh, setting aside kind of value judgments in some way. The other one is to say with a bunch of folks that come out of philosophical traditions and affect the study of religion called phenomenologists and others would say that what we want to do is bracket for a time your own kinds of beliefs and values and attend to the phenomena of religion as you're acknowledging it. So the assumption is that you can temporarily and partially set aside what might intervene and slant your interpretation one way or the other. And then in 1963, there was also the Supreme Court decision where they made this distinction about you know, what kind of religion could be taught in public schools. And, and the Supreme Court made this distinction between teaching about religion versus teaching religion. Yeah. And, and, and scholars sometimes get it wrong by assuming that that, that had something to do with the study of religion in higher education. It did not. What I argue, and I think legal historians would support this, is that what actually happened is that some scholars of religion in particular places, including public universities uh, in the 60s and later, started to say that the distinctions that that Supreme Court decision made between uh, relig studying religion and studying about religion, that's a good way to talk about it, some people thought. So they started to describe their work as teaching about religion and not teaching religion. The same kind of strategy I suggested that I had used at some public universities when I was saying we were talking about religion, but I wasn't trying to make them Presbyterians or Jews or Mormons or anybody else. 
That's right. So in your own experience, you talk about how you've gone from not really speaking about your own religious commitments in school settings to being more open about them. Is that fairly common in the field? And we can talk about what encourages that kind of disclosure and what maybe inhibits that kind of discussion. Yeah, I, th I think it a lot has to do with institutional settings. So if you're at BYU or Calvin College or, the, or Georgetown University, there's certain kind of possible things you can and can't do that are very different than if you're at North Carolina or Virginia or Florida State. So I think, it, I think the key thing that folks overlook is that there's no general answer to that. And so my thought was always focused on uh, what's the institutional setting? What's the mission of my institution? And, and the other thing I always ask is what's best for students? So moving from a public university to a Catholic institution, I could, of course, just come out and say all kinds of things. And I tend to, I tend to be a little bit more free here, but I still have, uh, I still have found that if, if folks say too much about their own, of what they're teaching, it just gets in the way of student learning. So what I used to say in public universities was that I was a person of faith. This is a weird strategy. I don't know anybody that has that does this. So, but it worked for me. It the worked tweed for my method. Students, I guess um, I I used to say because at at North Carolina and sometimes at Texas, uh, some students, sometimes evangelical Protestants, uh, Roman Catholics, others, would say, "Tell us about your own faith." And then whenever that happened, I would say theatrically, um, "I'm a person of faith." But saying more about that now would just would hinder your learning. But if at the end of the semester you still want to know more about any of that, and I can't imagine why you would, I'll take you all to lunch and I'll answer any questions you have. And what that did in some ways for a couple of students, they would just be determined to guess. <laughs> and as a, a heartwarming confirmation that I was doing it right, People, one student in one semester at North Carolina came in and said, you're Presbyterian, you're Jewish, uh, and, and guessed constantly, uh, never right, actually, um, about things. And then so, and, and in some classes, nobody comes. In other classes, one person would come. In my last class at Texas, after the final exams, I said, you have to, when you've done everything, I'll be happy to tell you. I can't remember how many it was. I want to say it might have been 14 students said, OK, we're ready and for lunch. And so I took 14 students <laughs> to lunch and they then proceeded to ask me all kinds of things about my own religious pos position. And I answered it because it seemed like the right thing to do. The only flaw with this strategy is what if somebody takes more than one class with you, <laughs> which, of course, yeah. is true. So that's a quirky way. I know people who would say. And public universities, they would just fess up to their stand. I'm agnostic, but I'm going to talk about the Bible. Um, I love Jesus, but I'm going to talk about history uh, or whatever they said. So that actually sometimes happens. More often, people try to step back from it uh, to some extent. But I think and I think that's useful because too much of the instructor pontificating I'm at a Catholic institution, so that's our verb here. <laughs> Pontificating about what where they stand might just get in the way of students thinking it through for themselves. Some of the discussion I've heard revolves around the idea of teaching at a religiously backed institution in some ways opens up a little bit more freedom, even as it constrains in other ways. So I'm thinking, for example, of someone who teaches at, at BYU, for example, They're, they can be much more openly confessional. In fact, they're sort of encouraged to embody the tradition in, in the course of their teaching, um, that they couldn't do that uh, as much at a state university. And so in that sense, there's this sort of freedom. But the flip side of that also is schools like this. And I don't know how much it's like this at Notre Dame. Maybe you can speak to that. But there's also a certain expectation of orthodoxy. So in other ways, freedom can be constrained. So it seems to be an interesting tension at these types of schools. Yeah, I think, I think um, for those who teach, whether it's the, uh, the Jewish Seminary in New York or it's BYU, or it's Boston College, I think um, in some ways people are look like they're freer to, to state their own positions. But tradition, but folks in traditions don't always agree. I know this will be a revelation to you <laughs> but, um, and to listeners. 
but but at some point um, there's a spectrum of beliefs beliefs and values within any particular tradition so there's always kind of you know are they the right kinds of presbyterians are they the right kinds of catholics are they the right kinds of members of uh, lds community so it doesn't mean that everything relaxes i think but i think the other side here is but it is you could actually attend a religious service at notre dame um, and see students there, and it, and they wouldn't be surprised uh, to find that. So I think that's an important difference. But at the same time, um, as I was saying before, taking too strong a stand about what kind of Catholic or Presbyterian people should be can actually inhibit that. The more surprising freedom that I have found at Notre Dame, which I thought might happen, but it's been truer than I would suspect, is that at some public universities that I've taught at, a whole range of social kinds of issues, um, social justice issues were really harder, much harder to talk about, it, even though it might seem surprising. So talking about um, uh, peace, uh, uh, I don't want people to kill each other. It seems like a pretty uncontroversial thing to say but it's more controversial if you're teaching near places that have major military bases mm -hmm. right? or where legislatures um, would, might interpret that as being unpatriotic. Um, on issues about poverty, I think uh, we should help poor people. Again, that seems like a Pollyannish, crazy, simple thing to say, but worrying about poverty and the causes of them can make some people narrative. If you, racial justice, I think we should treat people uh, fairly. Immigration, I think we should treat uh, immigrants uh, humanely. And I think we should um, you know, realize the promises of America as a place that welcomes immigrants. All of those kinds of stands on social issues can be highly controversial in public universities. I have found a kind of freedom here to take stands on issues about peace and justice and sustainability, ecological mm -hmm. things, that are all much more controversial in state universities, which I think some people would be surprised to hear. And that might be another, that might be a thing that, that is true at other religious educational institutions too. Yeah, it's such an interesting tension, these differences between state-run institutions, private institutions, religious institutions, all these different dynamics. And I think at any of these institutions, there are these sort of borders that you learn where they are and, and, and what crosses the line, and, and it differs according to where you're at. So it's really interesting to hear from someone at another university talking about that. We're talking with Thomas Tweed today. We're talking about studying religion in the academy and values. Let's talk about a little bit more practically because your presidential address gets into some practical discussion about how we go about talking about our values when they seem to differ. Um, and there are different ways that, that we can gain clarity, which is kind of one of your main goals. At least let's get clear on, on where, where we are versus where someone else is. So you talk about this two-step process. Yeah, and in some ways it's pretty simple. Um, we should talk about what what our fundamental values are, and then we should begin to sort of think about both what we share with others and um, what we don't. And then we should start talking about assessing them. And that's where the conversation gets more complicated. But to some extent, it's just a simple thing that if we just try to do the best we can to acknowledge what are the most important commitments we have in scholarship about teaching, about research, uh, we can begin to to make some sense of um, a way forward, I think. Yeah, it's, it's this idea of articulating your own position and being willing to appraise other positions and also willing to let your position be appraised. And I think this is sort of where people can get stuck. Yeah, that, that's where I think everybody gets stuck, including me. We all are happy to tell everyone else what we value. Um, the problem is part of my view is that we have to cultivate certain kinds of virtues to be worthy and effective participants in those kinds of conversations. Uh, humility, for example, and what I call um, uh, reciprocal generosity, meaning to be a participant in this, it means you have to give and take. If you only take, it's stealing. If you only give, it's arrogance. So I think we, we all need a kind of humility. I could be wrong. And we all need some kind of generosity that we, ha we, can't, we can't just do giving or taking. 
And those are virtues to cultivate, uh, I think. Uh, and if, if people are not open in that way, if they assume they could not be wrong or they're only there to talk, uh, it's just it's not going to end up being a conversation. It's a monologue and we should go to our corners of the tent. And that's where it gets especially tricky. It's not just like more secular or non-religious minded people who cause these types of problems or breakdowns in communication. The theologians can also fail to live up to these type of virtues that you talk about. Um, being being willing to admit fault or uh, or that they're fallible, or being willing to give reasons. So theologians might fall back on appeals to authority like their religious tradition or scripture, and then sort of on the flip side, more secular-minded folks might fall back on reason and history and science, and they get stuck in these boxes, and they're not not willing to give or take either way. Right. Now that's and that's the central kind of problem. And um, since I have a kind of modest goal, but just can't we keep the conversation going and can't we deepen it just a little bit? I think those are kinds of the problems. And so to some extent, what I was doing, although I felt awkward about it, was sort of challenging my colleagues on both sides of those kinds of issues. I was challenging folks who identify with the social sciences, with the natural sciences, who think they're being scientific and objective to just acknowledge that they also have certain kinds of values at stake and that maybe they could be open to multiple forms, uh, way, uh, ways of understanding the world. And I thought the theologians sometimes can close down conversations by appealing only to scripture and tradition and not reason and not a common human experience and so on. And, and, um, and, and not really engage scholarship across the disciplines as fully as they could, including religious studies scholarship about their own tradition whether it's LDS folks looking at historians writing about their tradition or Catholics looking at social sciences, scientific literature or whatever it is. My thought is that maybe it would be useful to talk to those other people, especially if you're inclined to say that my theological work is not respected sufficiently in the academy or in the public realm. To them, I'm saying, uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts and feelings, but if you'd like to be more respected, you have to engage actual scholarship that other disciplines are doing. And if you don't do that, you couldn't possibly expect uh, that kind of engagement in return. Yeah, it gets really hard. I, I'm also thinking about issues of authority, too, or set up bounds in terms of it's hard to get a hard-boiled, scientific-minded person to give revelation or these things credence. And it's also hard for more religiously inclined folks to allow their revelatory texts or beliefs to be critiqued by scientific approaches. But at least knowing where those boundaries are uh, can get a conversation going. Then the difficulty can also become your own, like people who are kind of quote-unquote on your own side can be skeptical of the enterprise. So if you're a religiously inclined person who's dialoguing with sci more scientifically inclined people, not that those two categories can't can't overlap, but but you know what I mean. Um, people within your tradition might be, oh, you're selling out. Uh, and the same with uh, someone who's got a lot of even atheistic scientific friends who are seeing you talk to theologians and they're saying, what are you doing? Like, why are you wasting your time with fairy tales? So you can start to, to get hits from your own side, so to speak, when you do some of these things. I think that's right. And that, that's why it, it can help with just kind of baby steps. And let's see if we can agree on a couple of uh, values, about epistemic values. For example, I think some of the theologians, some of the religious studies people, some of the scientific folks and some of the humanistic people can actually agree about what's, what's good scholarship is. So for example, if, if a book is one part of the book doesn't agree with another part of the book, almost everybody would say that's incoherent, it's not good. If somebody gives flat-footed, simple kinds of explanations for something and overlooks other compelling explanations, I think people would agree we should have complicated stories that represent that. We want empirically rich things. We want well-sourced things. We, um, and I think that actually there are some values that people share, and that is a kind of a better beginning place because we're not about to convert anybody to completely different worldviews, but I don't think we need to do that. All we need to do is to agree a little bit more about what values we do share so that when we then enter in conversations in the public arena, whether we're talking about to the State Department or to the school board or to educators 
in our own institutions, we can make more effective and passionate uh, defenses of why the study of religion is worthwhile. Yeah, I think that, that that's a really great way of summing up the emphasis you place on finding these common values, these these shared virtues, these shared aspire, even if they're <laughs> virtues that are being aspired to rather than completely embodied, then you can start to get some good discussions going. And I think it just, it lets people do the kind of work that they want to do as well. It's it, Part of the problem is when we evaluate other types of projects according to the stipulations of our own type of project and we want everything to sort of fit into what we're doing instead of meeting them halfway and seeing what are what exactly are they doing are they at least living up to the sort of standards that they've set for their own type of practice and but that takes effort that takes time like i get why why it's hard for everybody to do including myself so um and me too. Yeah, exactly. So since it's been a little while since you gave this presidential address, um, when we come back for the conclusion of the interview, we'll talk a little bit about how it's um, how, how things have gone since this time. So we're talking with Tom Tweed, and we'll be right back. I've both lost and found God a hundred times over, writes Ashley May Hoyland in her book, 100 Birds Taught Me to Fly, stories for restless souls like you who desire to know God more deeply. This Latter-day Saint author and artist explores the complexities of everyday faith through story and picture. For Hoyland, laughter, sorrow, and creativity emerge as gospel principles alongside faith, hope, and charity. 100 Birds Taught Me to Fly is part of the Living Faith series at Brigham Young University's Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. Visit bit.ly slash 100 birds to learn more. We're speaking today with Thomas Tweed. He was the president of the American Academy of Religion in 2015, and he's the Welch Professor of American Studies and a professor of history at Notre Dame, where he joins us from today. We're talking about value in the study of religion. So I wanted to see how things have gone since you gave this presidential address. Have you noticed any kind of changes or any kind of discussions that have cropped up since you gave this address? Um, yeah, it, it's been heartening to uh, to hear some of the responses. I think there's a couple of different kinds of responses. One of the responses is just in terms of the organization itself. I still hear talk about values among other um, colleagues who are in the leadership of the AAR, and we're doing a big, um, uh, the, the AAR board is doing a rethinking a strategic plan and things, and they're still talking about values. Uh, the AR webpage talks this way now. So a lot of the staff and uh, leadership has continued to talk that way, which is heartening and happy to see. And, and almost immediately after the, the address, uh, I, there was some warm responses from, um, from Muslim colleagues who really liked the distinctions about different kinds of values and saw that as a way to defend their work. And... Um, and in public universities, folks have been especially happy with the way I was talking about um, religion, higher education, and how to strategize about it. So I would say that has worked. And um, I would say some theologians have been perhaps more um, warm in receiving this than I had had thought. And, and I, I, I hear them saying, uh, you understand us a little bit, and that's good, and talking more about where we agree and don't agree. And I had a chance actually to talk with some um, departments in, in Europe and here that that have theologians and religious studies people and had some conversations about it. And one person uh, actually asked, could they use it before it was published? Could we please use it at a faculty retreat mm -hmm. so we can have some grounds to talk with one another? Um, so I, I'm, I'm quite pleased that it, it proved to be a, a way of framing the conversation. My own sense about it is I, I don't really care much at all whether anybody ever goes further with this. If it starts a conversation and it shifts to another register or a different vocabulary, that's fine with me. I just want to make things better. How has it impacted your own work that you've done? Well, I think, I think that it's impacted my work in some ways because people uh, who have read it know this about me more and uh, probably resituate my my work in some ways. I think a lot of people before I gave this address would have put me squarely in the religious studies side. And of course I am, I'm not a theologian. 
and theologians would be the first to tell me I'm not a theologian. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm clearly on the religious study side and on the academic study of religion side, but I think it's sort of opened up some conversations with other folks that I might not have talked with before. I'd already been thinking for a long time about these issues in my own work and struggled with how to talk about it. So I wouldn't say it affected my work much more, but I'm certainly, um, I have better reasons for thinking through uh, what kind of values are worked out in my own research and teaching than I did before. So one more question. When you're sitting down with a prospective student of religious studies who's just entering uh, into the academy, what's a sound piece of advice that you find yourself giving to students as they're considering entering that field? Yeah. There are traditions around the world when somebody says that they either want to join a religious uh, community of, of sort of challenging people to go away. So in Buddhist contexts, you knock and then you, they go away and you have to knock three times. Are you sure? <laughs> uh, I do a, another version of that where, where my standard has been for lots of years to say before we continue with this conversation, you should know a few things. There are not many jobs. You can't live where you want to live. You'll not make much money. And you're constantly evaluating and being evaluated. If you don't like any of these four things, let's talk about what you're actually going to do with the rest of your life. If people persist after that, I sometimes uh, give them numbers and advice about stuff. But I think I, I usually try to talk people out of it. And then I find that there are some people that just care deeply about it. And of course, I was such a person. When I came out, there weren't many jobs and the, the, the questions that people were having around me uh, at Stanford and Harvard, where I did my graduate work, was how many one-year appointments would you take before you left the field? Hmm. So people were taking one-year jobs. And I knew all that. I, my answer was two. I was lucky enough to get a job. And I did it anyway, because it just, I had to do it. And, and the tragedy to me that, that really worries me is that there's so many gifted young emerging scholars who don't have the right kinds of institutional settings awaiting them. And I think that's one of the things that we tried to work on when I was president and is continuing. How do we think about contingent faculty? How do we reimagine the university in, in this century in ways that give appropriate, humane working conditions and still manage to teach our students uh, well. Where do you recommend people go to sort of follow news on this sort of thing? If they're looking at the job market and looking at that, where do you direct people? Uh, I think the, the American Academy of Religion webpage is often good. The AAR actually even tells you how many of, of the people who applied for jobs last year, how many got employment and things like that. And there's, there's even a document on the AR webpage recommending that graduate institutions offer placement rates. But if I was thinking about doing it, the question I would ask to the person you think you might want to work with is, where are your last five students? Tell me what, what they're doing now. Um, and if the person does not know or doesn't have a good answer, I would probably rethink. I'm so sorry to all my colleagues out there who are now mad at me, but I would, <laughs> I would probably rethink... Um, going there it's where it gets really difficult because it's it's a vicious cycle in some ways where you want you want better and more students but you're going to get fewer of those the less you can place and the less opportunities there are the less i mean it's just this sort of vicious cycle it is and one of the things i worry about is that sometimes i i've been aware that i might be a kind of arrogant about this because i'm so worried about students not getting jobs and and my and my former advisees all have jobs, but it might be that somebody does not at some point. And I always thought that if I ever had a student not get a job, I would just stop taking graduate students. Hmm. But to some extent, what somebody said to me once that I think might be right is, you know, how dare you decide how someone should live a meaningful life? Maybe somebody just wants to do that for its own sake, for personal uh, enrichment prepare for something else, why would you shut it off? I think that's a really good point. Partly it's just me worrying about my moral obligations, but it could mean that what, what we have to do collectively is what the AR is doing more and more, which is think about what are the multiple careers yeah. that that scholars of religion could go into. Yeah, they had a special session on that at the conference this year. 
we've been thinking about that a lot. We've had panels about it. There's new initiatives. There's a new task force about it. Hmm. Um, so the question is, what else could you do? And and then the, the key thing is, how do we link up more effectively those potential employers to those um, who need work? And I think that's one of the things that the American Academy of Religion is doing now and wants to do even better in the years ahead. Is it kind of like like State Department stuff and like maybe uh – high school type education like what kind of places are people looking it could be all, all kinds of things it could be things uh, about publishing it could be things about um nonprofits. it could be things in government work hmm. it can be things um yeah i think there's an enormous range of the different kinds of jobs people who work in uh nonprofits in the state department in higher education but not as tenure track people People who've gone to admissions or development or student affairs, let's say the university. Yeah. Well, I'm glad there are a lot of people thinking through these issues. Um, the American Academy of Religion is one of the main places where these discussions continue. Uh, I recommend people check out your presidential address from 2015 uh, on valuing the study of religion. It talks about uh, the values that religious studies scholars themselves seek to maintain or should articulate. And it also talks about how to value the study of religion, as we've talked about throughout the interview. And people can also check out the contribution that you made, Tom, to the Mormon Studies Review Volume 1. You have a great article in there uh, about Mormonism, so people can check that out as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about these issues. Thanks, Blair. It was my pleasure.